so, so then my first question was just quickly about this event today. Why is it important that the Muslim community mobilizes, uh, forms the polit political action committees, gets the community uh, civically engaged? It's a big question and it's an important question because when we don't organize, we can be abused and mistreated, not just here in the United States, but all over the world. And even when we look at the genocide in Gaza, it's really American foreign policy, bad American foreign policy that allows that. It's without the United States, there would be no genocide. We we fund it, we arm it. And because we really weren't organized enough to flex our political power, we've basically been begging for 13 months for something to end. And what we realize is politicians respond to the people that they know. They respond to the people that donate to them, that got them in office. They respond to the people that fund their campaigns. And here's the thing, we are right. We're on the right side of this issue. But in the United States, being right is not good enough. If, if being right was good enough, this genocide never would have happened. We're winning the battle on social media. But if tweets or Instagram posts could end a genocide, it would already be over. You have to organize yourselves in really powerful ways. I hear everywhere I go, we're in Texas now, all over the country, Muslims are more aware of this than ever. Part of why we're in this position is we have not organized ourselves politically the way we need. It's not that we we thought it wasn't valuable, but now we, we understand the consequences if we're not organized. Muslims and indeed Americans are facing a very stark choice in what is believed to be one of the closest or tightest elections in uh, recent history. You've been disillusioned with the Democrats in recent years, but you came out, I think, in support of Kamala Harris. No, no, no. I've, I've, I've paid an enormous price by saying I would not support her. Uh, no, I've never supported her. I ran against, I, I worked for Bernie Sanders in 2016 and 2020. Mm -hmm. We ran against her. I, I meant the appointment of her as the, the choice of her as the nominee for the vice president. You said oh. that it was a great thing that a, a black woman was... Yeah, I mean, I think uh, when Joe Biden, I mean, first, you know, I love Joe Biden. We we ran against Joe Biden. I always thought he would be a horrible president. I I've seen him as a political enemy for my entire adult life. Of all the people that Joe Biden said he was considering, it seemed like maybe she was the best person. But we see now, I mean, she is as loyal to the Democratic Party. She has been as really it, it feels like as Islamophobic as 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 Joe Biden. There's nothing she's done for Muslim voters to to win our support. For me, she's just been a, a grave disappointment. And I thought she would be a much better vice president, even not just on issues for Muslims. I thought she'd be a better vice president in general, but she has, she's just been a bad vice president. The role of vice president, it, it's difficult to be effective in that position in general, but no, I, I, I can't point to one thing that she's done that has impressed me in that role, even beyond this genocide. And so, no, I had hopes that uh, she would be a better vice president but no, she's, for me, been a disappointment all around. Now, I've opposed her as president. In this race, you know, Muslim voters have really been cornered. And, you know, we don't have a candidate in either of the two major parties that we can feel good about. Well, over the weekend, um, I don't know if you saw this, but there were a group of Muslims, uh, including imams, who publicly um, voiced their support at the Trump rally. I saw it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in the swing state of Michigan. Um, what was your reaction to that? Everybody's asking me this. Three different people asked me about it just before you because it was a spectacle. And I want to tell you, I have a, a pretty nuanced answer to that question. Donald Trump has been an enemy to Muslims. And this is the man who authored the Muslim ban. He has killed Muslims around the world, including he openly admitted that he ordered the assassination of General Soleimani from Iran, who was a, a heroic figure there in Iran. So like, he's not our friend. And he's not going to be our friend if he's elected president. But we've also seen Joe Biden and Kamala Harris oversee what is one of the lowest moments of my entire life. So when I saw these men uh, endorse him and, and, and give what I thought was a very passionate, heartfelt endorsement, they meant it. They were serious in their endorsement. I would never have done that myself. But when I watched it, I saw two or three things. Trump seemed to love it. And I've never seen Trump openly love Muslims the way I saw him yesterday. Trump loves people that kiss his butt without shaming or embarrassing these men. I mean, these men said, God saved Donald Trump two Twice, times yeah. for, for this moment. Mm -hmm. And I thought Trump seemed touched. 
But anytime you appeal to Trump's ego, it opens his heart. I had never seen, the crowd was almost exclusively white and mm -hmm. conservative. These were Muslim men in thobes. Like these were Muslim men in religious garb. That audience had never cheered for Muslims a day in their life. So as much as I despise Donald Trump, it was a very fascinating moment to see, Surreal. you had to see an openly conservative, racist white audience cheer Muslim men, to see Trump very pleased by it. And here's, here's the bottom line, politically, you can't influence anyone you don't have a relationship with. So if you wanna influence Kamala Harris, you have to have a relationship with her. If you wanna influence Donald Trump, someone has to do it. I, I would not have done it. That's not even me judging those men. You have to also view it through the lens of Michigan. Michigan is in a, it's a swing state. Trump is, we're in Texas. Trump is going to win here. But where I live in New Jersey, Trump is going to lose 100%. Well, Michigan's different. And Muslim voters there are, are struggling like all of us to figure out who do I support? Do I just support Jill Stein? Do I support Cornel West? Do I vote for Kamala Harris? And we shouldn't expect any Muslim to just support Democrats or just support Republicans or just support independents. I think we have to be mature enough to know there is value in supporting everybody. It is still painful because Trump has been so openly Islamophobic. It's still painful to see Muslim imams and, and leaders, you know, brag on him and love on him in that way. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I thought there was still value in it. Um, the Green Party's uh, vice uh, presidential pick, uh, Dr. Butch Boer, recently attacked Mehdi Hassan, the political commentator, for a post commentating on October the 7th, where um, Mehdi stated that killing civilians and children is always wrong, whether it's Hamas or whether it's the Israeli government. Um, the accusation basically was that he was guilty of both sides. Of them. What do you sure. think? I know Mehdi really well. We were colleagues together at The Intercept. Mehdi is my friend. There is not one political commentator in the world I don't have disagreements with. I disagree with my wife politically. I disagree with my mother politically. Like there is, I don't know a single person on the planet that I share every view with. Mehdi is mature enough for us to disagree with him on something. He is on many issues. I've been frustrated with a take he's had. And then I can tell you a hundred times where I thought he had the smartest take on an issue of anybody I'd heard. Mehdi is a, a brilliant thinker, commentator, debater. Butch has every right to critique Mehdi. If Mehdi and I could have a debate and disagree on things, and then we would go out to dinner afterwards. Like, you can disagree without being insulting, without making it out as if he has no value. I, I don't want to say 99% of the time I agree with Mehdi, but 85% of the time I do. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's still a lot. And he has real value there. What do you think about his view that both options, whether it's Trump, whether it's um, Harris, they're, you're going to get your hands dirty either way. And obviously he is, again, he is not saying people have to vote away. He's just giving his point of view and saying that I think, you know, the Muslim community should be voting for Harris. Have you, have you made a decision? I'm not voting for Kamala Harris or, or Donald Trump. I, I have voted, and I've said this publicly, I have voted for the Democratic presidential candidate in every presidential election of my life since since 1996. And so I'm 45 and in every election since I've been 18, I've always voted. Now I have voted independent in other races, but I've always voted for the Democrat for president. Sometimes holding my nose, sometimes very, almost always mm. holding my nose or frustrated or disgusted. Yes, a, a genocide is a red line for me. I would not only be violating my faith, my hundreds of Palestinian friends, I, I could never vote for anybody that oversaw this genocide. It's um and and here's the thing, you know, there's a group in Michigan called Uncommitted. Yes. I was watching Uncommitted very closely. And Uncommitted wanted to be able to endorse her. They wanted to be able to support her. And the little thing they went from asking her to oppose the genocide to meet with them. To basically saying, Can you just have a single Muslim speaker at the convention? Yes, yeah, yeah. Can you have a Palestinian? They can even be a supporter of yours. And they said no. They that had, was extraordinary, wasn't yeah, it? They had, they, they had Republicans speak at the Democratic National. They had a dozen Jewish speakers at the Democratic National. Mm -hmm. They even said, listen, they can be your supporters. And they said, no, I was deeply insulted by this. Mm -hmm. And then finally they said, well, will you just meet with a Palestinian family? Who doesn't do this? If someone asked me to meet with my political enemies, I'd be willing to do it. If I thought there was some discussion that could be valuable, but that she wouldn't even have a private meeting. It, it, it's not that she did nothing. Mm. She insulted us. Mm. 
at this point, I oppose her. And that wasn't my choice. That was her choice. She put she, you in the position. Yeah, I feel like she so. spit in our face. Mm-hmm. People could say, well, this was what she was advised to do. Was well, she the presidential candidate or not? Mm-hmm. She could have made this decision. Mm-hmm. And, and that she didn't. I just think even politically, I, I've managed political campaigns. I've worked for political campaigns. Mm-hmm. I don't understand what they were thinking. It would have cost her nothing to meet with a family. What about all those Muslims who are saying that we've gained so much by allying ourselves with the Democratic Party? We have a lot of positions within government, uh, within the administration. Um, all that would go down the tube if uh, Trump was elected because all those people would be removed. Well, I'll say something to you that I said uh, to some men I was speaking to a few minutes ago. I'm okay with there being... Muslims that have every type of political view. I think it's unreal. Listen, in the United States, I last read that Muslims in America are from a hundred different countries. We're of every age, every economic class. It's unrealistic to expect all Muslims to be Democrats, for all Muslims to be Republicans, or for all Muslims to not be a Democrat or a Republican. Muslims are diverse, sophisticated, complicated. I think we're being a little ridiculous to expect every Muslim to vote a particular way. And even though I wish every Muslim would vote a particular way, mm. it's a it's an unrealistic expectation. And so when we start to insult people, you close the door. I'm good friends with Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. I knew her before she was a congressperson. I campaigned for her. I donated to her campaign. She's a Democrat. Now she feels the party has hurt her. It has betrayed her. They, they've done nothing for her. Even the party has worked against her, but she still is a registered Democrat. And so do we oppose her? Of course not. We can't just speak in sound bites. These conversations require nuance. Um, as a Muslim media platform, I wanted to talk about the mainstream media and how it treats minorities and, and on the issue of Gaza as well. Um, you spoke out about the firing of Mark Damon Hill from CNN and you also yourself were banned from Instagram uh, uh, without, I think, any right of appeal. Is that still the case? Yeah. Yes, yeah, they, they, they've told me it was a, light, a permanent lifetime ban. Okay, okay. So why is the Western media willing to put a spotlight on humanitarian stories ad infinitum, but for some reason when it comes to Palestinian uh, suffering, um, th- those stories, that, that the issue is either ignored or sanitized. Well, I mean, I, I think what we've all learned over these past 13 months, you know, when, uh, when I'm fr- I'm, I've known Mark Lamont Hill for maybe 10 years, and um, he was a brilliant person to have working at CNN. He, he has, uh, Mark, Mark is a Muslim, and understands world issues and world affairs. So it was a huge loss when they fired him. You know, they... They fired him basically because he spoke at the U.N. And at the end of his U.N. speech, he said, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Mm -hmm. Now what's wild is, you know, the the Benjamin Netanyahu's son literally has in his Instagram bio, you know, from the river to the sea, Israel will be free. And and no one cares. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so what we see is, you know, the American media is blatantly Islamophobic, often openly racist. And... You know the suffering of not just the suffering of Palestinian people, but what you what you see not covered in American media is who is causing the suffering. So you could look at the New York, even papers that are seen as liberal, as the New York Times or the Washington Post or 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 a station like MSNBC. They'll say uh, fifteen Palestinians died today. Well, did they die of cancer? Did they you know died how? No, they didn't die. They were killed. You know, it, like or they'll say explosion kills for children. Where did the explosion come from? Was it a bomb? Was it a bomb from the United States? And so now people are comparing when you see anything that happens to Israel, or if you see the the better comparison is anything Russia does to Ukraine. They will say Russian missile kills this number of Ukrainians. But when an American bomb dropped by Israel kills Palestinians, they make it like those Palestinians uh, blew themselves up. And so Islamophobia, racism, bigotry, these things have a huge impact on the way American media works. Again, on the issue of how the media treats pro-Palestinian voices, I wanted to address a recent story, um, it was back in October, that the media ran with, and it was, uh, you were accused of falsely claiming to have been involved in the release of two oh, American Israeli soldiers. I'm, all, I'm so glad to talk about this. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but that claim would turn out to be false, right? right? So can you tell us what actually happened? Yes. So this was such a peculiar, fascinating moment. And I don't regret my role in it. And I don't regret a thing that I said. And that could be even complicated for my own supporters. On October 9th, 
there were there was a a young American teenager and her mother who were taken by Hamas. Her brother was a follower of mine, and he followed me on Instagram. And on October seventh, eighth, and ninth, he had been commenting, and we took pictures of all of this. He had been commenting on my page saying, can you help me find my sister? His sister had protested against police brutality. She was a, at the time she was 15 during the protest for George Floyd. And his brother said, listen, me and my sister are supporters of yours. And they knew that I had friends in Gaza and friends in the West Bank. And they said, is there anything you can do? Well, he had been commenting on my page for days. I never saw it. Eventually people started emailing me saying, Sean, this man, his name is Ben commenting on your page and he's saying his sister's there. I started messaging with Ben privately. I had a dozen phone calls with him. He asked me on behalf of his family. He was asked to be a spokesperson for his family. Most of his family lived in Israel. He lived in Chicago, worked in Chicago. He asked for my help and for about two and a half weeks, me, and I said this publicly, me and about 50 other people, her her grand, the, the young girl, her grandfather worked at NBC and there were people behind the scenes, including myself, who were doing everything we could to see if she could be released. Well, what, does, what did that entail in doing what, what, what yes. were you doing? I made, I made dozens of phone calls. I sent direct messages. I sent emails. I posted, I posted about her publicly. People were saying that were you talking to the Qataris or, you know, but you were just highlighting the case in the social media. Is that what you mean? My primary role was to highlight her case. And, and even, in, even in the first post that I made. So you clearly I, documented that this was, but some members of her family had said, oh, we know, well, they well, were in Israel, they didn't know about it. Well, here, well, here's what's wild. So her father eventually came out and said, he did. her father came out and said, I did not know that Sean, was, I did not know that my son asked Sean for help, but my son did ask Sean for help. Sean did help my family. And he then said, please never ask me about this again. Yeah. And, and of course, when he said that, no one talked about it. And for days and days, people were saying, I never spoke to the family. And so, that, I mean, I, I... You I, had to defend yourself. Yeah, I had obviously. to defend myself. I had to share it. I had to... I re, thankfully, in New Jersey, you're allowed to record phone calls. Yeah. I recorded my phone calls. Yeah. When she was freed, the only reason she was freed was because there were dozens of us fighting for it behind the scenes. Or I would Here's how I would say. Why do you think she was freed? Not you. Tell me why she was freed and no one else was. Yeah. Like, just answer that. Yeah. There were other there were other girls. There were yeah. other people her age. She was freed because the men who freed her saw and heard from people they trusted that asked them to free her. Mm -hmm. And I, I never said ever that it was because of me. I always said I was one of many. So you've been closely involved in the Black uh, Lives Matter movement and civil rights for many years. Some elements of the media have variously questioned your racial identity, your fundraising ethics. Are those have, have there ever been uh, legitimate journalistic lines of inquiry or is it mudslinging motivated by bias? No, never one time has one respected media outlet asked me a question. Have they ever said, like, please, please answer these questions for us, Sean. If I stole five cents from a charity or family, it would be a crime. It doesn't, you don't have to just steal a thousand dollars or a million dollars. Misappropriating funds is a crime. Stealing from families, these are crimes. But you can say this about people and nothing happens. Never, there is not a single family on the planet who says, Sean raised this money for us and we never got it. Mm -hmm. These things were created out of thin air and it is so effective. Because if you think someone stole from a family, all of a sudden you don't have to listen to a word that person says. So even though no family has ever said this, no reputable media outlet has ever said, actually, here we here's where Sean misappropriated these funds or stole this. These 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 lies online have cost me so much. And and um, I'll continue to have to, to have to fight the against them. Yeah. yeah. Um, final question. You've been passionate about the Palestinian cause for years and that's focused on what obviously what's going on in Gaza. Uh, indeed, I, I think you cited that as one of the reasons why you converted to Islam uh, earlier in March. Uh, from a Christian pastor to a Muslim, seven months on, does it feel like the final destination of your spiritual journey? My journey is still yet to unfold. You know, my life is there's, you know, uh, inshallah, I have a lot of life to live. I'm, I'm never going to become a Christian again. I, I still have a deep admiration and love of Jesus. I, my time as a Christian is still very valuable for me as a Muslim. I don't think most Christians understand even uh, how revered uh, Jesus, peace be upon him, and, you know, I, you know, they don't understand that. In Islam. Yeah, yeah, and they don't understand uh, even how much the, the you know, our 
the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, how much he, he respected Jesus and the role of Jesus. Being a Muslim is, is at the center of my life. It's, it guides the decisions that I make. I've always been a man of faith, and so it wasn't a, a radical pivot for me the way people may think, but, uh, but, it, but it's been a beautiful time for sure. Sean King, thank you so yeah, much thank for you. speaking to me. No, thank I appreciate you. it. Yes. Really appreciate thank you. Thank you, sister. Appreciate wonderful. you.